Questions without notice, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Under Labor's tax plan, anyone earning under $125,000 will get a bigger, better, fairer tax cut the compared to stage the one of the, the opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the House and the Treasurer are interjecting so loudly I cannot hear the question. It's only the beginning of question time, but I'm cautioning members on both sides. It's the Leader of the House who wants me to listen very carefully to the questions. Uh, I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to commence his question again. Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Under Labor's tax plan, anyone earning under $125,000 will get a bigger, better, fairer tax cut compared to stage one of the government scheme. So why won't the Prime Minister support Labor's plan to give 10 million Australians a tax cut of $928 a year, almost double the tax cut they'll get from his government? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. We are a government that believes in Australians' enterprise and their aspiration. We believe Australians should be entitled to aspire to get ahead. <coughs> to get a better job, to invest in their business, to make some real economic progress in their lives. Aspiration is at the very heart of everything we are doing, seeking to support Australians to realise their dreams. Mr Speaker, in the very DNA of our parties, the Liberal and the National parties, we believe that government's job is to enable you to do your best to realise your dreams, to aspire and to get ahead. You'd think that was pretty straightforward. You'd think that every Australian would embrace that, Mr Speaker, but the not the Deputy Lindsay. Leader of the Opposition. Today she said, today she said, honestly she said, this aspiration term, it mystifies me. <laughs> Members on my right. Members on my right. The member for Sydney, the member for Sydney, can, no, the mem members on my right will cease interjecting. Does the member for Sydney have a point of order? I'm seeking leave to table. The member for Barker is warned. I'm seeking leave to table a document. No, you cannot do that in the middle of an answer. It's very clear in the standing orders. The member for Sydney will resume her seat. The Prime Minister has the call. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, imagine, imagine how her great hero Paul Keating would feel now. Keating said only a couple of years ago, he said the Labor Party has lost the ability to speak aspirationally to people and to fashion policies to meet those aspirations. Well, there's no reason why they no doubt why they've lost the ability to do so, because it's all a mystery. It's all a mystery. From the hard scrabble streets of Rosebury, with the household income of just under a million dollars, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition says aspiration is a mystery. Well, I'll tell you what, we believe that every Australian is entitled to aspire to have great ambitions and high hopes to seek to do their best, to seek to get the best job, the biggest business, to realise their dreams. That's what we stand for. It's what Labor used to stand for, but no more. This privileged elite opposite, they want to keep, they want to keep the workers in their place. No, I remember when the Labor Party had members that had really worked. I look at this group of university educated apparatchiks. I don't see any Jack Fergusons there. I see an educated, privileged class that wants to kick the ladder out for so that others can't realise their dreams. Members on my right. Members on both sides.
quite obviously to all members, the level of interjections is far too high. I named, I've mentioned a number of people over recent days. I've warned a number of people. Uh, I'm going to remind them that 94A does not require a warning, and uh, I've taken note of a number of people loudly interjecting, and I'll take whatever action is needed. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, seeking to table a document— I am. I'm seeking to table the transcript from which is the Prime Minister quoted. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Well, why, why can't I table The member for Sydney will resume her seat. Leave is not granted. The member for Sydney will resume her seat. The, the member for Leichhardt will resume his seat. I'm not going to labour the point. The member, for Sydney, the member for Sydney knows the rules of this place. She had to seek leave. Leave was denied. She's not going to remain at the dispatch box and debate the matter. She was warned yesterday on two occasions. She will now leave under 94 a the member for Sydney will leave under 94A. Yeah. Members on my right, I'm not going to keep warning people day after day. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. The member for Leichhardt has the call. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government's plan a stronger uh, economy is supporting the aspirations of all Australians, including my community of Leichhardt. And is the Prime Minister aware, aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. The honourable member knows all about aspirations. He knows all about hard work. He knows all about getting in, having a go, realising your dreams, being prepared to back yourself. He knows, he knows that that is what makes the Australian economy work. The enterprise and the belief and the courage of Australians overwhelmingly. Small and family businesses, under $50 million turnover, the ones that are getting the benefit of our tax cuts that Labor wants to repeal, that's where most Australians work. That's where the jobs are being created. Now we want to enable every Australian to have the highest hopes, the greatest ambitions, to make their aspirations a reality by giving the incentives to get ahead. The deputy leader of the opposition said today aspiration was a mystery to her. A mystery to her. And, and you know. And so it used to be what the Labor Party was about, but that was in the days when the Labor Party members had actually worked, where you had truck drivers and boilermakers and brickies. You had real workers. Manual labour in those days was not the Mexican bandit it is to Labor today. Mr Speaker, Labor has failed and is failing the very people member for Morgan. they were founded to represent. Now, because of that stronger economy that we are enabling, that we're seeing, because of the record jobs growth we're seeing, we have the resources to pay for the essential services Australians need. That's why we can increase funding on public hospitals in the electorate of Longman and the northern part of Brisbane by 53 per cent over the time that Labor was in. It's why we're able to offer a five-year hospital funding agreement to the states, which will involve $30 billion more spent on public hospitals. And that is why our comprehensive income tax reform rewards enterprise and initiative. It is one that will see 94 per cent of Australians pay no more than 32 and a half cents in any extra dollar they earn, from $41,000 up to $200,000, a marginal rate of 32 and a half cents. It's a massive reform. It rewards effort. It encourages enterprise. It, it, it provides the support for the aspirations that is at the very heart of our beliefs, but is now a mystery to Labor. The member for Jagger Jagger. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Treasury has confirmed the entire third stage of the government's personal income tax scheme goes to the top 20 per cent of income earners at a cost of $42 billion. $42 billion. How is it fair that under this arrogant and out-of-touch Prime Minister, a property developer in Arncliffe earning a million dollars will get a tax cut of over $7,000 a year, while a worker in a charcoal chicken shop in the same suburb the member for Jagger, will Jagger will resume her seat. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm glad the honourable members uh, giving uh, the residents of Point Piper a rest today has decided to uh, have a go at uh, the property developers in Arncliffe. Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is this. The fact of the matter is this. That under, that, that under the current tax uh, regime in 2015-16, for example, the uh, taxpayers earning over $180,000 pay 30 per cent of the total personal tax take to the government, and they represent 4 per cent of taxpayers. Under our plan in 24-25, there will be 6 per cent of taxpayers earning over $200,000, and they will pay, wait for it, 36 per cent of the total tax receipts from personal income tax. Our plan rewards aspiration, encourages investment, encourages employment, and it is thoroughly progressive, and as is the case now, but more so, those on the highest incomes pay most of the tax. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline to the House how the government's plan for lower, fairer and simpler taxes will reward effort and protect aspirational middle income earners from bracket creep? What would be the impact of opposing the government's plan? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Robertson for her question and her tireless advocacy advocacy for low and middle income earners That's in right. her electorate. Because she understands she's from an electorate that understands aspiration, and she's been championing aspiration all her life, Mr. Speaker. And in this place, in this place on top of that, in the budget we announced a comprehensive and responsible plan for personal tax reform, Mr. Speaker. In, uh, see, a plan is when you're actually dealing with problems in the tax system. And yes, our personal tax plan goes first to provide relief to those on low and middle income earners. But in steps two and three of that plan, it begins the work of dealing with problems in our tax system, which is the problem of bracket creep. The problem of bracket creep, Mr. Speaker. Because if you don't deal with bracket creep, as people's incomes creep up, they get taxed more and more and more. And that puts a stymie on aspiration and their incentive to get ahead. Stages two of the plan sees the second, thresh the, the thresh second threshold go from 37 to 41,000. That's hardly a millionaire, Mr. Speaker. And it, and it goes from 90 to 120,000. Also, hardly a millionaire, as I'm sure the uh, residents in Robinson would understand. So it's a plan that deals with problems. The Labor Party doesn't have a tax plan at all. They don't have a plan. They have no plan. I'll tell you what they've got a plan for, Mr Speaker, and that's to oppose $70 billion of tax relief for hard-working Australians. And that as, their as their incomes creep up, they will tax them more. So what they've announced today, Mr Speaker, is a creep tax, Mr Speaker. A creep tax by taxing people's income as it creeps up. As it creeps up, they will tax them more. And Labor's plan for low to middle income earners is to ensure they stay low to middle income earners by not supporting the plans for a stronger economy that we champion. But as the Prime Minister has already referred to today, we understand why. We understand why, because when the member for Sydney has regrettably had to leave the chamber, Mr. Speaker, when asked to this today, it's part of a broader plan and it's about ensuring aspiration within the economy as well as the Prime Minister reminded. What did she say, the member for Sydney? Were, were I honestly, this aspiration term, it mystifies me. That's what she said. 
Now, I know a lot of things mystify the member for Sydney. Government living within its means, economics, finance, even geography is a great challenge to the member for Sydney who thought Africa was a country. Well, aspiration isn't in a country, Mr Speaker. Aspiration isn't a continent even, Mr Speaker. But I can tell you what, it can drive a nation forward, member for Laura. and that's why we believe in aspiration. And the Labor Party has turned their back on aspiration as they turn the their back on Australia. The has concluded. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why won't the Prime Minister support Labor's plan to give 70 per cent of working Australians a bigger, better, fairer tax cut compared to stages one, two and three of the government scheme. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government's uh, personal income tax plan rewards aspiration. It encourages Australians to get on Member for and Lindsay. have a go. It gets rid of bracket creep across that huge spectrum of incomes between 41,000 and 200,000. 94 per cent of Australians won't have to pay more than 32 and a half cents in any extra dollar. But, Mr Speaker, I'll give three reasons, three additional reasons, why Labor's plan lets down hard-working Australians on middle incomes. A police sergeant in Queensland could be working in Longman, perhaps, would pay under Labor's alternative $1,253 more tax. Or a school principal in Tasmania might be in Braddon, would pay an extra $3,500 more tax. Or a police inspector in South Australia might be doing, working in Mayo, would pay $4,050 more tax. The Labor Party talks about millionaires and billionaires paying no little attention to the reality that everything they are doing is patronising and seeking to hold back hard-working Australians, hard-working Australians who want to get ahead. Only the most arrogant and out-of-touch Deputy Leader of the Opposition would say aspiration was a mystery. I tell you Members what, on my Mr left. Speaker, how out-of-touch do you have to be to be mystified by aspiration? How smug! How smug in your big government salaries do you have to be to say you're mystified by aspiration? I tell you what, we understand aspiration drives the nation forward. It is the powerhouse, it is the ambition that we seek to support and enable and Labor seeks to hold back. Just before I call the member for Denison, which I will in a second, I'd just like to do a couple of welcomes um, in the gallery this afternoon. We have the former member for Gilmore, Jonah Gash, uh, welcome, and the former member for Petrie and current uh, Attorney General of Queensland, Yvette Darth, welcome. And I call the member for Denison. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, a whistleblower tells me that from 1 July, Centrelink will stop backdating payments to the intention to claim date. This is unacceptable because people needing Centrelink can initially be in crisis and unable to lodge the paperwork immediately, for example, women fleeing domestic violence. And when they do, the process can be convoluted with delays commonplace. This change would also appear to be illegal because Section 13 of the Social Security Administration Act 1999 clearly intends that a person is taken to have made a claim when they first contact Centrelink. Prime Minister, will you stop this unfair, unlawful and sneaky attack on the most vulnerable members of our community? The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. The government the is, is, is committed to ensuring more Australians find jobs, maximising their ability to support themselves and their families. However, for those who are unable to find work, we have a strong social welfare safety net. And the only reason we can continue to guarantee that into the future is because we've got a strong economy. The honourable member from Tasmania understands well 
how strong, much stronger the Tasmanian economy has become because of the great Liberal leadership of Will Hodgman, supported by our coalition government in Canberra. Now, the honourable member described this change as uh, unlawful and sneaky. Uh, the honourable member would recall that it was a policy change which was part of the Social Services Legislative Amendment Welfare Reform Bill which was debated and passed by the parliament in March this year. The honourable member did not speak in the debate, but he did vote against it. Uh, the change is made in Schedule 11 uh, of the bill, so it is both lawful and very transparent. And The rationale for the amendments, and I am quoting from the bill's digest that, of course, is uh, available to everybody, uh, as the deeming provisions were introduced at a time when claim forms were mailed to com claimants completed and then returned to Centrelink by mail. With the progressive rollout of online claiming, those provisions are no longer necessary, and that is why, in the debate the honourable member voted in and presumably paid attention to, the change was made. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Uh, will the minister update the House on the importance of creating a tax system that rewards the effort of hard-working and aspirational Australians, right. including in my electorate of Brisbane. And is the minister aware of any threats to the government's agenda? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I thank the member for Brisbane for his question, and I only wish that the members in Longman, the people in Longman, had somebody as hard-working as the member for Brisbane. Let's hope that before too long we'll see Big Trev join Little Trev in this place, because both Trevors, both Trevors know how important it is that people keep as much of their hard-earned money as they possibly can Members on both to sides. save, to invest and to be able to get ahead. And that is precisely why this government has put in place a tax system that is designed to help all Australians, whether they be business owners, employees, the young, the old and everyone in between. And under our personal income tax changes, under our tax plan, 94 per cent of taxpayers will pay no more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. Those opposite, unbelievably, would not only stand in the way of that tax cut, but they would hit Australians with more than $200 billion worth of new or increased taxes. It's enough for many Australians to think, what is the point? What is the point of expanding their business? Because the Labor Party will tax it. What is the point of actually doing an extra day of work, of going for that promotion or doing some overtime? Because Labor will tax it. What is the point of trying to get ahead and Members build a rush. savings nest egg? Because Labor will tax that too. And worst of all, what is the point of trying to be self-sufficient in retirement when Labor will just pocket your tax refunds through their mega retiree tax? It is death by a thousand taxes for the dreams and aspirations of millions of everyday Australians. The member for and Bruce I suppose is we warned. all know why. Because tellingly, Mr Speaker, we heard from the member for Sydney who reflected the views of those opposite when she said, honestly, this aspiration term, it mystifies me. They do not know what aspiration means. And for the benefit of those opposite, I'll educate them. It means wanting to get ahead. It means Member having for more opportunity warned. for yourself and for your family. <coughs> Those people opposite want to cut down the aspirations of millions of Australians. And the leader of the opposition, he calls hiking up taxes. He calls that brave. I call it a smash and grab. There is nothing brave about that. There is nothing brave about ripping off older Australians. There is nothing brave about ripping off workers, young Australians who have got low balance superannuation accounts, and there is nothing brave about the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, we know that Australians want lower, simpler and fairer taxes. The Labor Party stand for higher taxes, and the Leader of the Opposition would the deliver The member's that. time has concluded. The member for Rankin has the call. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can this arrogant and out-of-touch Prime Minister yeah. confirm that under his government's tax policies, an investment banker from Woolara earning a million dollars a year will get a tax cut of over $7,000 a year? 
The bank will get a company tax cut with $17 billion going to the big banks, but a shop assistant from Caboolture will only get a tax cut of $10 a week, and that's before they lose up to $77 in penalty rates. The Prime Minister has the call. Speaker, uh, I, I want to thank the honourable member for uh, raising the subject of penalty rates because, uh, because he's sitting with a group of Olympic class champions at getting rid of penalty rates, trading them away one after the other. How many students, how many students working on weekends at McDonald's can't, don't get any penalty rates at all? Because of the agreement entered into by their union. Oh yes. The member for Rankin. Not, not a cut. They get nothing. The Labor Party has failed those workers, and you know what, Mr. Speaker. The Prime the Minister. The Prime is, Minister will resume his seat for a second. Okay. Well, you've just jumped the queue. The member for Morton can leave under 94A. And the member for Lawler, who's been warned, can leave under 94A as well. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, under our personal income tax plan, people on the higher tax bracket of $200,000 plus will pay a larger share of the total income tax collection than they do today. So, if that's the definition of progressive, it is much more progressive than it is today. So, the Labor Party has no basis for complaining about the equity of the tax plan. But this is the big difference. Just like the member for Sydney, the member for Rankin does not want that person working on a low or lower middle income to get ahead. Does not want them to get ahead. The member no, for Rankin is now the idea, the idea that someone on forty or fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars may aspire to earn more is lost on the privileged elite of the Labor Party opposite. Oh yes, they those seats used to be filled by men and women who had worked, who had worked with their hands, who had done those low income jobs, and now we get one university educated apparatchik after another who's got in there got in there and is failing the very workers their forebears used to represent no wonder paul keating is disgusted by the failure of the modern labor party to connect to australians aspirations we know australians want to get ahead we know they are encouraged by the stronger economy to get ahead, and we will constantly remind them that the greatest threat to that stronger economy is the modern Labor Party, with its denial of aspiration, the denials of self-advancement that workers for generations used to deliver through the efforts of Labor representatives. This, is, this Labor Party is a disgrace to all the Labor history and Labor leaders of the past. Members on my right, the member for Gilmore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the Minister update the House on how a strong economy means essential services like the defence of our nation can be assured? What would be the impact of alternative policy directions? The Minister for Defence Industry. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hate to contradict any of my colleagues on the front bench, but some of them have been saying in question Mr. time today that not one member of the Labor Party knows anything about aspiration of Australians. Well, there is one, actually. There is one. There is one, Mr. Speaker. There's one with quite a lot of aspiration. The member for Greenland knows all about aspiration, Mr. Speaker. So while I don't like to contradict the what Minister for Revenue, who said not one member of the Labor Party knows anything about aspiration, our friend over here, old China, he's got quite a lot of aspiration, Mr. Speaker. And you know, a few people have been saying that the member for North Sydney might pit him at the post. But I reckon after this morning, he's already got rid of her under the chariot wheels, Mr. Speaker. He's only got one more to go. Our friend over here, the leader of the opposition. 
If I was you, if I was you, I'd be getting my suit dry cleaned, Anthony, because you might get there faster than you think. I know you're sitting there looking like the Sphinx, but your aspiration is well known to us all. But, Mr. Speaker, I, that's the introduction to my answer. That's <laughs> my answer. My answer is actually. That's good because I was about to say. If the minister the will just pause for a second, could it? Minister can perhaps hit his pause button for a second. Because <laughs> I was about to say, story time's over. You're not reading it very well now, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, because of the government's excellent economic management of the budget and the economy, we've been able to make sure we can invest in our defence industry and our national security in this country. Because of the management of the budget and our economic management, we can invest in 12 submarines, nine future frigates, 12 offshore patrol vessels. 21 Pacific patrol boats for our Pacific neighbours. Labor was never able to invest in any. We're able to invest in Poseidons and Tritons for our combat, for our, our, our reconnaissance and our surveillance, Mr. Speaker. We're able to, to improve and upgrade every single Army, Naval and Air Force base in Australia and build the combat reconnaissance vehicles here in this country, driving $200 billion of investment in our military capability that Labor could never have afforded to be able to do. Now, Mr Speaker, the Labor Party announced today that they will vote against, they will vote against income tax cuts tax cuts for all Australians. This privileged elite, Mr Speaker, this privileged elite who want to ensure for themselves, well my first job, I was a cleaner. I was a cleaner in my first job. But I, I'm glad I wasn't represented by the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker. No. Old Mr Clean event over here. Mm. I would have lost all my uh, my resources as a university student, Mr Speaker. But this privileged elite they want to deny people $70 billion worth of tax cuts, Mr Speaker. We want to deliver $140 billion. They say it's $70 billion or it's zero. It's like saying to people, Here's the, we want to offer you roast pork, crispy roast pork roast with apple sauce and then just serving them the apple sauce. That's what Labor wants to do, Mr Speaker. Half the hamburger, not all of it. The The Leader of the Opposition. Questions to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's earlier answer when he said that his government rewards aspiration. So under this Prime Minister, should a 60-year-old aged care worker from Burnie aspire to be an investment banker from Rose Bay just so instead of their $10 a week tax cut from the Prime Minister, they can get the Prime Minister's $7,000 a year tax cut for investment bankers? Members on my right, the Minister for Home Affairs. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member should remember that the 60-year-old aged care worker in Burnie is entitled to aspire to get a better job, is entitled to get a promotion, is entitled to earn members more, on my left is entitled to be able, be able to earn more money, and no aged care working, working in aged care is a good job. But you're entitled to seek to earn more. You, no, Mr. Speaker, everyone is entitled. Everyone is entitled. The Prime Minister to resume his seat. The Prime Minister resume his seat. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. The Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. Prime Minister has the call. That's right, Mr. Speaker. Every worker, every Australian, is entitled to aspire to earn a better income. That, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, everyone is entitled to aspire to that. It's the Labor Party that seeks to hold them back. And the aged care worker in Burnie, the aged care worker in Burnie, may get promoted, may get another job, may earn more money. And they will know that they will not pay any more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar in extra in every dollar of extra income they earn. Aspiration, seeking to do better, 
The honourable member calls out, sit down. That's what he's saying to Australians who want to get ahead. That's what he's saying to every Australian that wants to get ahead. Sit down, he says. He says, I'm a snob. Oh, really? He does. He says, I'm a snob. I'm a snob. That's what he says. Members this on my is left. The man, this is the man who sucked up and grovelled to Dick Pratt like there was no tomorrow. He did. He went there. He took free trips overseas. He drank the champagne. He sucked up to the big end of town. He sold out the workers. He sold out the workers. And he, you know what, Mr. Speaker, I have seen, I have seen a lot of wealthy people in my days, and I've seen, I've never seen anybody more sycophantic in the presence of a billionaire than a Labor politician, and none more so than this sycophant, this groveller, this man who abandoned workers while he tucked his knees under the Pratt's table and sucked up to Dick Pratt right up until the time when it was no longer useful for him to do it. No integrity, no consistency, no loyalty. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The member for Melbourne Ports will leave under 94A. The member for Hughes. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of a strong, united and consistent approach to protecting Australian borders? And would a change in this approach affect Australia's national interests? The Minister for Home Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Hughes and thank him for the great work he's doing in his electorate. He's a great local member, Mr Speaker. And he is one of many on this side that supports the government's strong border protection policies. When John Howard left government, Mr Speaker, in 2007, there were four people in immigration detention including no children, and yet when Labor was elected, promising to the Australian public during the course of the election campaign that they would make no changes to the coalition policy in relation to immigration and border protection, they allowed 50,000 people in on 800 boats and 1,200 people, Mr Speaker, drowned at sea. Now, we're hearing exactly the same rhetoric from this Leader of the Opposition as we heard from Mr Rudd and from Ms Gillard. And, Mr Speaker, as sure as night follows day, if the Labor Party is re-elected at the next election, the boats will restart. There is no question, Mr Speaker, there are certain limbs of our policy which cannot be changed, and if they are, the boats will restart. And I see, Mr Speaker, some interesting words from the Labor candidate for Longman, where Ms Lamb was quoted as saying—and this is a direct quote— at this point, at this point, it's not Labor's policy to resettle people in Australia. Now, Mr. Speaker, we didn't put people on Manus and Nauru. The Labor Party put thousands of people on Manus and Nauru. We lifted another six people off Manus yesterday, so that brings in total a number to 292 that we've taken from Manus and Nauru that Labor put there. We've taken them to the United States, and we are cleaning up Labor's mess. But it takes time. Now, you would have thought that people like Ms Lamb and others would recognise that the people smugglers listen to every word that we utter in this place and they mark it on social media where there is a potential change or a softening or a weakening of border protection policy. And those people smugglers are up in Indonesia now rubbing their hands together at the prospect of this leader of the opposition being elected as Prime Minister of this country, Mr Speaker. If Labor brings people from Manus and Nauru and basically basically raises the white flag, they are sending a message of defeat and encouragement and, dare I say, aspiration to the people smugglers in Indonesia, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party has learned nothing, nothing at all, from the Rudd and Gillard years, and this Leader of the Opposition 
who is weaker than Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard combined, is unable to stand up to people like Ms Lamb. So if you're in Wambiran or you're in Caboolture or you're at the Burpengary Tavern having a beer tonight, have a look at what's happening in Europe at the moment, where hundreds of thousands of people are trying to make their way across the Mediterranean. If you think that can't happen in this country again, look no further than the failure of Labor's past record and what they would guarantee the if they're elected at the next concluded. election. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that racist hate speech was hurled during a violent brawl at a Liberal Party meeting last night, with a witness reporting, quote, they started bashing him, they took him outside and started kicking him. To be honest, I thought he was going to die. Will the Prime Minister refer Liberal Party members using racist hate speech to the Human Rights Commission under Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, notwithstanding his personal objection to that section? The Leader of the House, on a point of order, members will cease interjecting. I have made it very clear. The Minister for the Environment and Energy will cease interjecting. I need to hear the Leader of the House. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Mr Speaker, there are many things within the Prime Minister's responsibility, uh, but this is not one of them. While it's a serious matter that's been raised by the member for Isaacs, uh, it has been referred to the police, uh, and that is the appropriate place for which it, with which it should be dealt, not uh, by the Prime Minister in question time when it's not his responsibility as the federal leader. If I can address the point of order without the Menzi, member for Lindsay interjecting yet again, I'm happy to hear from the uh, Deputy Manager of Opposition Business, but I think the, um, the responsibilities of ministers and the Prime Minister are very clear. We've been over this ground many times before. The Prime Minister is not responsible for party matters. Uh, and um, well, actually, no. The Leader of the Opposition isn't either. <laughs> I don't think the question's in order. Uh, I'm happy to hear a case from the Deputy Manager of Opposition Business, but... Uh... Mr Speaker, it goes directly to the Racial Discrimination Act, Section 18C, and the possibility of a referral uh, of any Australian citizen who's used racist hate speech to the Human Rights Commission. It's something on which the Prime Minister has often spoken uh, and indeed supported attempts to repeal this Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, that's what the question goes to. The manage Deputy Manager of Opposition Business will. The first part of the question is um, certainly not in order. And just for the assistance of the House, I'm going to remind the House of my previous rulings uh, on parts of questions being uh, out of order. And I'm going to say quite candidly, in my view, deliberately out of order. I'm going to say that very candidly, and I'm going to rule very harshly on those in the future, as I have in the past. And I'm just giving the member for Isaacs, uh, as deputy manager of opposition business, the benefit of the doubt on this one occasion today. I don't think the second part of the question is in order myself, but I'm prepared to let the Prime Minister address it if he wishes to. Could the attorney uh, just pass me a note which advises that only an aggrieved party can refer matters to the Australian Human Rights Commission? So that's uh, that is first point. I would I would say also in terms of the incident, uh, the statement that the Liberal Party New South Wales has put out reads as follows: The Liberal Party has been made aware of an incident that allegedly occurred at a meeting tonight. The party will fully cooperate with the police in relation to the inquiries. An internal investigation will also be undertaken and disciplinary action taken against those responsible. The Liberal Party strongly condemns the kind of behaviour that is alleged to have occurred, and I entirely concur in that condemnation by the New South Wales Liberal Party and look forward to their providing full cooperation with the police in their inquiries. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business, the Workplace and Deregulation. Will the minister update the House on how the government is ensuring that members of registered organisations get a fair deal? Is the minister aware of a different approach? Good. The Minister for Small Business and Family Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. 
Uh, put simply, Mr Speaker, the approach of the Turnbull Coalition Government after the last election was to introduce the Registered Organisations Commission, the independent regulator for registered organisations, be they unions or employer organisations. The alternative, uh, Mr Speaker, is those opposite who want to abolish the Registered Organisations Commission. Those opposite, the Leader of the Opposition and his team, want to abolish the very organisation that was investigating individuals like Derek Bellum, the former secretary from the New South Wales branch of the National Union of Workers, who was yesterday sentenced to four years jail for intentionally defrauding union members of more than $650,000. As, Magist as Magistrate Elizabeth Ellis told the court, and I quote Mr Speaker, the workers that came under the NUW include factory workers, storemen, those at the lower end of the wage spectrum where membership came out of what I can only consider to be scant spare funds. And what was Derek up to, Mr Speaker? A bit of the following. Bot Botox injections, home tanning kits. P&O cruisers. Hang on. P&O cruisers, Mr. Speaker. P&O cruisers. So the Botox and the tanning kits now make some sense. You can't turn up with wrinkles and no tan. Brass knuckle stubby holders. Yes, you need those on the cruise to hold your beer. A tattoo of his parents on his calf. Geez, that's a bit ordinary. A tattoo of his parents on his calf. Lawyers, lawyers for his divorce. He was using members' funds. For his divorce. Obviously, the cruise didn't go that well. And he was using members' money on websites like Cupid.com and Match.com. So obviously, Derek's bounced, Mr. Speaker. Derek's bounced. Why would the Leader of the Opposition vow to get rid of a body that investigates individuals like this and prosecutes them where they see fit? Why? Because as the Daily Telegraph revealed in August 2015, the National Union of Workers help fund a slush fund to help Mr Shorten, the Leader of the Opposition, become the Leader of the Opposition, against the People's Choice, the member for Grainler. These are the kind of people, that, the kind of union members, that the Leader of the Opposition has done his secret deals with. Whether it's the CFMEU, we still don't know what's in that. Whether it's John Secker, as he kicks and assaults police. These are the people that the Leader of the Opposition is beholden to even those on his own front bench who don't know what's in these secret deals have cause, and they are, to their credit, not naming themselves but talking to journalists. The Leader of the Opposition will put his union mates ahead of all Australians, whether they are union members or not, on every occasion, and we must ensure he remains the Leader of the Opposition. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. When he met with the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands last week, did the Prime Minister offer to provide any Australian government aid to repair the environmental damage caused by a subsidiary of Axiom Forest Resources, whose logging practices on the Solomons were described in official reports as amongst the worst in the world? And given the Prime Minister was chairman of Axiom Forest Resources at the time this destruction occurred, is the Prime Minister providing any advice about the delivery of this Australian government aid? Members on both sides. The member for McEwen, the Prime Minister has the call. Questions with the uh, Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands covered many matters, but they did not include the matters referred to by the uh, honourable member. The member for Capricornium. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government is building the infrastructure hard-working Queenslanders need to get home sooner and safer to their families. Does the Deputy Prime Minister know of any roadblocks to our job-creating plan? The Deputy Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, because of a strong economy, we can invest in essential infrastructure such as roads and rail. Yeah. That's, what, that's what a strong economy does. And I thank the member for Capricornia for her passionate advocacy, for her aspirational people. For the 98,000 or so constituents, all of them aspirational, in the seat of Capricornia, Yapoon, uh, 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 Rockhampton and all those areas that she represents. She's a strong voice for the people of central Queensland. She wants to make sure that every waking moment she is there trying to build community capacity, certainly making sure that her community's the livability is enhanced. 
And she's delivering. She's delivering in spades. $24 million of beef roads. More than $110 million under the Northern Roads, Bowen Road, Capricorn Highway and Peak Downs Highway. She's, in, she's investing in her community with $5 million for the Rockhampton Airport Pavement Upgrade Project under the Building Better Regions Program under that fund. Also, $12.4 million under the Regional Jobs and Investment Program. What a great initiative that is, with a number of projects, including a crocodile farming and agritourism value-added production system, on-farm beef processing facility and accommodation village, the Fraser Park uh, development, redevelopment project and new fruit processing facility for central Queensland. Mr Speaker, all these projects build community capacity, as does the $176.1 million project, the Rookwood Weir. And I know how much. I know how much that's going to help drought-proof Rockhampton. I know how much investment that has been put into that, how much capital investment, but also how much uh, uh, commitment that has been put into that by the member for Capricornia. These projects delivered by her show exactly how the LNP Team Queensland is delivering for the Sunshine State. It's something that the people of Longman also understand. The Liberal and Nationals government here in Canberra is investing $15.4 billion through the infrastructure investment program in Queensland, including an additional $3.3 billion for the Bruce Highway, bringing the total Australian government up to $10 billion. A billion dollars for the M1 Pacific motorway. Now that's going to help Longman. A $390 million for the Beerburrum to Nambour rail upgrade. And I know how much the members for Fairfax and Fisher are relying on that particular project, are investing in that particular project. That's going to help the people of Longman. $300 million for Brisbane Metro, $170 million for the Cunningham Highway. I haven't received any letters of thanks from the uh, member for Blair, but I know it's going to mean a difference for his people. $160 million for the Outback Way. For the Outback Way. The Liberal and Nationals Infrastructure Investment Program, $75 billion development pro program, is helping the people of Queensland, the people of Australia. I'm asked about roadblocks. There he the is, right in front of me. Deputy the Prime Minister's time has concluded. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How can the Prime Minister possibly justify spending $25 billion a year on stage three of the government's personal income tax scheme and on its big business tax cut, when under this Prime Minister, gross debt has reached half a trillion dollars for the first time in Australian history? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank the honourable member for his question. And of course, we've seen net debt uh, peaking. We're turning the corner on the debt that he and his colleagues in the Labor Party created. We're turning the corner on debt. And, Mr. Speaker, I notice the honourable member referred to a uh, reduction in tax as spending. You can't spend money that's not your own, you know. That is the Labor Party think. The Labor Party think that every dollar every person earns and every business earns belongs to the government. So that if you reduce tax, it's spending. It's their money. That's the difference. And you know what? They have an aspiration to keep more of it. The member for Page. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how the government's investments in health are supporting rural and regional Australians, and is the minister aware of any different propositions? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the member for Page, who was a very successful uh, business leader before coming to this place, where he worked in helping people to realise their dreams and their aspirations. And one of the things that he learned, and one of the things that he knew, was that you can't have successful individuals unless you have a successful economy built on a plan which delivers a million jobs, which allows you to guarantee the essential services which are fundamental, such as record funding for Medicare, record funding for hospitals, $30 billion of additional funding over the course of the five-year agreement, and record funding in mental health. One of the first things I was privileged to do on coming to this role was to visit Grafton with the member for Page. We met with families who had been touched by youth suicide. He advocated, as did those families, for better rural and regional health outcomes in mental health through a headspace for Grafton. 
That, I am pleased to say, is now a reality. It's a reality because we can afford to do it. It's a reality because of his advocacy. It's delivering those services to people on the ground in Grafton and in the surrounding region. Another thing that uh, the member did was he represented young Violet Rickard. And Violet uh, is a six-year-old with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. He argued that the drug Spinraza should be listed and, uh, if it's approved by the BBAC, listed immediately. I've just had today news that Violet is on the Spinraza program following the listing by the Treasurer on Budget Night. She has had her second infusion, and to quote from her parents, they are over the moon and can see the results already. She is now able to lift a spoon and feed herself, something that she could only dream of a few months ago. That is why all of us are in this place, to deliver those outcomes for children who would otherwise never, had act, never have had access to those sorts of medicines, otherwise never have had access to a headspace. That's what comes from good economic management, real outcomes that change lives in fundamental ways. And where I'm asked, is there an alternative? I've seen this in Tasmania, where we've seen a Labor government, a Labor federal government, which left $290 million of funding a year, as opposed to a coalition government, which is delivering for hospitals in Tasmania $415 million a year. We're now moving to $515 million a year of funding and an additional $730 million through the Mersey, as a result of our economic management and our hospitals agreement. Only last week we announced with the Prime Minister an additional $2.5 million for GP outreach services through the University of Tasmania to Burnie and Wynyard and Smith and, and Strawn. That's what good economic the management is about. And unless you can do The Minister's time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the government confirm that it is unwilling to have the parliament vote on legislation which only deals with the July 1 tax cuts, even though it would pass both houses today? Why is the Prime Minister threatening that unless the top 20 per cent of income earners get a tax cut in six years' time, then lower middle income earners will get nothing now? The Prime Minister has to call. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have a comprehensive personal income tax plan. Comprehensive plan for reform. Now the Leader of the Opposition voted for it in the House of Representatives. All of it. We did, all of them. They all voted for it. And they could vote for it again in the Senate. And then, filled with confidence about their prospects at the next election, they could sweep back into government so they plan and they could amend it and repeal it. Why don't they do that? It's open to them. The only people that are standing in the way of tax relief for Australians on July 1 are the members opposite. The member for Wright. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment and Energy. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is reducing power prices in Queensland households and businesses, including in my electorate Wright? And is the Minister aware of any conflicting propositions? Minister for the Environment and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for right for his question. Federal Labor left us a huge mess when it comes to energy, Mr. Speaker. They left us a huge mess. When Labor was last in office, energy prices doubled, Mr. Speaker. The networks were gold-plated. The gas market was ignored, and the warnings were ignored as to the impact of such last large exports from the East Coast. And what did the Leader of the Opposition do when he was a senior minister in the Rudd Gillard Rudd years? He sat idly by and did nothing, Mr Speaker. Too bot busy plotting and scheming around the lazy Susan to do anything about energy prices. And what about the member for Port Adelaide, Mr Speaker? When Jay Weatherall conducted his big experiment in South Australia, the member for Port Adelaide wasn't sitting idly by, he was egging him on saying let's take this project national, Mr Speaker, even though South Australians paid the highest prices in the country. Mr. Speaker. In contrast, we have an energy plan that is working, Mr Speaker. That is working. We have reined in the power of the networks, and if the Labor Party did it, it would have saved $6.5 billion. We've ensured more gas is available for Australians before it's exported overseas. We're getting a better deal 
from the retailers for thousands of Australian customers and, of course, the National Energy Guarantee will leave Australians $300 a year better off than they were under the Labor Party. And it's been supported by the big energy users, the Blue Scopes, the BHPs, the Rio Tintos, the National Farmers, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to energy prices, lower energy prices under the coalition are not just an aspiration, Mr Speaker, they're a reality, Mr Speaker. They're a reality because in Queensland, in Queensland we have seen prices starting to come down. Mr Speaker, we've seen the big three reduce prices across New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. Like for Tyrone Farming, Mr Speaker, a family-owned vegetable business in the electorate of right, which Glenn and Sally run. And they employ more than 60 pickers and packers, drivers and mechanics, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's carrots or beetroot, whether it's onions or pumpkins, Mr. Speaker, they are delivering it to the market. And with lower power prices, they can employ more people, Mr. Speaker. This is what the coalition is delivering. So at the next election, there will be a clear choice. Under the Labor Party, with their reckless renewable energy targets, with their track record of delivering blackouts and higher prices, you will get more of it. You will get more of it from Labor. Under the coalition, we are reducing power prices and we will deliver a more reliable and affordable system for all Australian families and businesses. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to reports out of this morning's coalition party room and ask, will the Prime Minister acknowledge that Australians are paying the highest energy prices on record because of a lack of policy certainty caused by this government being obsessed by infighting? How can Australians have confidence in a government that fights with itself over energy policy everywhere, in the party room, in the parliament, through the media and even in charcoal chicken shops? <laughs> The Prime Minister, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, as the honourable member knows full well, the big factors behind the increase in energy prices in recent times have been failures of policy by Labor governments. And the honourable member knows very member well Bird. about this because, the for because of warned. his time, the time when he's at home in South Australia. He knows what it's like the when Prime you Minister have energy policy Prime Minister driven just by left for a second. Wing. Prime Minister, the member for Burt has been warned. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he was interjecting so wildly he didn't hear me warn him, but I want him to have no doubt now. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. He knows what it's like when you combine uh, Labor Greens' ideology and idiocy, which is precisely what happened in South Australia, where you got to the point where the wind resource in South Australia could generate more than 100 per cent of the state's demand one minute and then zero per cent the next, and there was no planning to store it or back it up at all. And the honourable member knows that, as do all South Australians. The reality is this, that our policies are working. Labor failed in allowing export of gas from the East Coast without looking after the Australian domestic industry and demand. We've put, we have ensured there is sufficient gas available, and we've seen wholesale gas prices come down over the last 18 months by around 50 per cent. The honourable member is very well aware of that. We've seen wholesale generation costs come down by about 30 per cent over the last year. We're starting to see reductions in retail prices across the East Coast, the markets of the national electricity market, and there is a lot more to do with the national energy guarantee. We are already seeing and delivering lower energy prices. There's more work to do. Labor should support the national energy guarantee. It will deliver affordable and reliable power and, at the same time, enable us to meet our Paris commitments. The member for Barker. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Urban Infrastructure and Cities, representing the Minister for Communications. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is working to ensure that the NBN is affordable for consumers and businesses? Is the Minister aware of any risks for this important national project? 
the Minister for Urban Infrastructure representing uh, the Minister for Communication. Well, I do thank the member for Barker, who is a very strong advocate for the communications needs of his electorate. And a very strong advocate was needed because in Barker, in September 2013, when the coalition came to power, the number of premises connected to the NBN fixed network it wasn't 60,000, it wasn't 6,000, it wasn't 600, it was six. There were six people, six premises connected to the fixed NBN network when the coalition came to power in 2013. Today, of course, the number is 51,000 ready for service. 28,177 connected, 99 per cent rollout complete in Barker. And of course, you could look at another important South Australian electorate, the electorate of Mayo. In September 2013, there were 813 premises connected to the NBN fixed network. Today, 42,710. Mr. Speaker, the NBN is being rolled out across the country. 43% of premises now taking 50 megabits per second or higher. And of course, what is the economic impact of the rollout of the NBN? If you happen to be, for example, somebody who's aspirational, somebody who wants to build a business, well, an interesting report by the Regional Australia Institute says that in the biggest town in Barker, Mount Gambier, it's expected that over the next three years there will be between 240 and 700 additional businesses, 1,200 to 2,370 additional jobs as a result of the NBN being available in Mount Gambia in Barker. Now, if you are a well-paid Labor MP married to a well-paid bureaucrat, aspiration might be very puzzling to you. As you, as you sip your decaf latte, your decaf soy latte, as you munch your kale and quinoa salad, you might wonder what is this aspiration thing. But I can tell you, in Barker, in Mount Gambia, the fact that there can be up to 700 additional businesses, up to 2,370 additional jobs because of the NBN being connected, delivering jobs, delivering economic opportunity, because the NBN is being rolled out across the country, that is what the coalition government is doing. We are delivering for the people of Australia with the NBN rollout and in so many other ways. Members on my right, the Treasurer will cease interjecting. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. TAFE teachers, students and apprentices from all around the country are gathered in the gallery today for National TAFE Day. Can the Prime Minister please explain to TAFE supporters in the gallery today why he's cutting another $270 million from skills and apprenticeships in this year's budget while still giving $80 billion to big business? And will the Prime Minister reverse his opposition to Labor's plans to cover upfront fees for 100,000 TAFE places and train more Australians the for well-paid, secure concluded. jobs. The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Mr Speaker, I can inform the House that every young apprentice has aspiration, Mr Speaker, and plenty of it, and plenty of it. And when it comes to the Labor Party's record on apprenticeships, they saw the biggest single drop in training numbers on record, Mr. Speaker, 22 per cent fall in their last year in, when they were in office, Mr. Speaker. And do you know who was responsible as the minister when 110,000 apprenticeships lost their position, Mr. Speaker? The leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, as the employment minister, as the employment minister. See, the years between 2011. It's a setup. The prime minister said, "It's a setup. It's a setup." In the years between 2011 2013, the Labor Party cut incentives for apprenticeships not once, not twice, not three times, but nine times, Mr. Speaker. 
$1.5 billion, Mr Speaker. And who could remember the disaster of the vet fee help disaster, Mr Speaker, where you had some funding for courses like veterinary Chinese herbal medicine, Mr Speaker, graduate community advocacy, Mr Speaker, and a diplomacy in lifestyle consultation, Mr Speaker. They were, they were the courses at the Labor Party. In contrast, the Turnbull government is delivering a $1.5 billion Skilling Australia's Fund, Mr Speaker, sporting, supporting 300,000 uh, aspirational apprenticeships, Mr Speaker. A $70 billion infrastructure rollout is looking to support apprentices all the way, and of course, the VET system is now, is now getting going, Mr Speaker. So at the end of the day, you can look at the Labor Party record where they cut all the apprentices, they cut money out of the program, and in contrast, we're creating hundreds of thousands of new positions for aspirational apprentices across the country. The member for Swan. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Social Services. Will the Minister update the House on the progress of the National Redress Bill and the significance of this important piece of legislation to survivors of child sex abuse? The Minister for Social Services. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member for his question. And can I acknowledge this is an issue which is very dear to his heart and I know has touched his family. And uh, I'd like to thank him for the contribution he's made to this debate and the passage of this bill. Um, yeah, yeah. As, as I would all members of this House, today the Senate passed the National Redress Scheme. Uh, what it showed was that this parliament, every single member of this parliament, both here in the House and in the Senate, was able to put survivors first. And today will mean a lot to those survivors. Uh, come 1 July, we will be able to provide them with redress. And our task now, and I say this very much in a bipartisan fashion, is to make sure we deliver that redress to the best of our ability. It will involve a payment up to $150,000, access to psychological counselling services and a personal apology by the institution. Not only do we have a commitment from every state and territory government to join the National Redress Scheme, but we also have the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Salvation Army, the Scouts, the Uniting Church and the YMCA agreeing to be part of the scheme. That takes coverage to over 90 per cent, and I look forward to other institutions joining over the coming weeks. Prime Minister, when we met with survivors and with the Premiers of Victoria and New South Wales and their Attorney Generals at Kirribilli, Leonie Sheedy was there, who has advocated incredibly strongly for this National Redress Scheme. You will remember she cut your tie in half. She cut Dan Andrews's tie in half. Mark Speakman's and Martin Pakula's, and then headed to cut my tie in half. I said to Leone, uh, I didn't want to do that now because I wanted to see the passage of the bill through before I cut the tie in half that I wore that day. I'll be going back to my office. I'll be cutting that tie in half, and I will be sending it to Leone. And I would like to now call on the Shadow Minister for Social Services, Jenny Macklin, to say a few words. The member for Jagger Jagger on indulgence. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, on indulgence, and I thank the uh, minister very much. And maybe he should uh, wait until he sees Leone and lets her cut uh, his tie. Uh, I'm sure she'll uh, take gr great pleasure in doing so. Uh, I do want to associate uh, the opposition with the words of the um, of the minister and thank him for his commitment and his. Uh, hard work, frankly, to uh, get to, the, to today. As he said, uh, it is an extraordinary achievement, first and foremost, for the survivors of child sexual abuse, for the care leavers uh, from institutions. Uh, and of course, as all of us know, 
no amount of money uh, will give uh, these uh, people who were abused as children. They won't get their childhoods back. But it will be a way in which all of us, all Australians, can acknowledge and pay some compensation for the horrific abuse that people have suffered. Today is a very significant day. It will be a difficult task, a very, very difficult task for this uh, redress to be um, delivered. A lot of people will have to uh, remember again the abuse that they suffered, uh, but it is something that people have worked very hard for, and I thank the government for their efforts. Here, here. The Prime Minister asks that further questions be placed on the notice paper. I thank the Prime Minister.